So, who are you? I am a professor of marketing at uh, Judge Business School. Uh, I um, have uh, a PhD in marketing from the University of Southern California in LA. I taught at UCLA and Tilburg University in the Netherlands before moving to Cambridge um, and the UK. Um, my research is on innovation. In the first part of my career, I studied innovation in large Western companies. And more recently, I've become interested in innovation in emerging economies and in small companies. And I un as I understand it, you are uh, applying some of um, the research that you have learnt uh, in the uh, underdeveloped world to uh, Western thinking. There's another book in the pipeline. Yes, so, um, you know, as I said, I got, I was, I don't know, working on big companies in the West, and then in around 2006 or so, I noticed that a lot of these large Western companies, the Fortune 500 companies that are among the biggest spenders on R&D worldwide, had begun to set up large centers uh, in places like India and China. And so I got interested in that and uh, visited both countries and particularly India. I spent a lot of time trying to understand what was going on. And then realized that the approach in places like India to innovation was quite different from what one was used to seeing in the West in large companies. In particular, these uh, innovators in resource constrained environments like India were very frugal in their approach to innovation. They were very good at taking cost out of the process and doing more with less. Um, and also their approach was quite agile and flexible. They were able to move quickly from one plan to another. They improvised a lot. There was a lot of lateral thinking. Um, and often their solutions were inclusive in that they were designed to bring people who were outside the formal economy into the formal economy. So my co-authors and I got really interested in this and uh, began to realize that this was common to most developing countries uh, and was a result of their resource constraints and also the uh, volatility of the environment. And so and we came across many ingenious solutions that people had found uh, to, to meet unmet needs using what was there you know, what was in abundance, and using what was in abundance in a way to neutralize the scarcity. Um, and we saw solutions in telecommunications, in the way that mobile phones, for instance, had uh, both the handsets and the services had been uh, made affordable to very large numbers of people, generating all kinds of wealth for the companies and the people themselves, in farming, in agriculture, in small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, by improving productivity, and then how mobile phones themselves would be used to develop uh, financial payment solutions like M-Pesta, or healthcare e-health solutions, or educational solutions. Um, and then, we, you know, interested, I got interested in uh, all kinds of energy solutions that were being developed, solar lighting solutions, off-grid and mini-grid solutions using biomass and wind and things like that. And automotive, cheap cars, uh, forms of transportation, affordable forms of transportation for people. So this became uh, very interesting to study. And my co-authors and I wrote a book which came out in 2012, which was specifically about frugal innovation in emerging markets and what Western companies operating in those emerging markets could learn from them. And, um, and then after that book came out in 2012, um, we realized there was a lot of interest in frugal innovation in the West, for the West. Uh, and uh, we realized there were some parallels with what was happening in the emerging world, but there were some differences as well. So to some extent, particularly since the financial crisis, more Western consumers have become bank conscious in the way that emerging market counterparts are. But uh, Western consumers have also become what we call values conscious. They're concerned about the environment, they're concerned about inequality and uh, social justice. They uh, then try to apply um, the resources they have to try and solve these problems in the West. And most importantly, increasingly, uh, many consumers in the West are empowered to do more with less now. Uh, so small teams with 
relatively limited resources can do what only large companies could do 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, uh, small teams are now empowered by cheap computing, things like the Raspberry Pi that, I'm, you know, there's now a four pound Raspberry Pi or five dollar Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, cloud computing uh, software that helps them to do all kinds of things like design and so forth. Uh, 3D printers, uh, crowdfunding if they need money, outsourcing or manufacturing someone else if they can't do it themselves, social media to market their product, Amazon to, to distribute it. So they have all these tools uh, which can help them to do the entire innovation process from getting an idea to developing it, prototyping it, um, uh, raising money to manufacture it, outsourcing the manufacturing if needed, uh, distributing it, advertising it. Um, and as a result, we're seeing something of a frugal innovation revolution in the West, which is linked in many ways to a startup revolution that we see. And in a place like London, for instance, we have a whole ecosystem of fintech or financial tech startups edutech or educational tech startups, there are energy startups, there are medical device startups, uh, diagnostic startups. Uh, so it's a very exciting time and I think essentially we're seeing the ability of people and sometimes governments to do more and better with less in the West as well as the developing world. How would you compare the motivations of founders of startups in the developed world against the motivations of founders of startups in the developing world? That's a great question. Um, I think in some ways the motivations are the same. Both groups essentially want to make a difference and they believe in the power of business to make a difference. They do want to generate uh, profits. Uh, partly to support themselves and their families, but also in order to be able to grow their businesses. So often there's both uh, what might be called a social motivation, trying to make a difference, solve a problem that exists, meet an unmet need, but equally there is what might be considered a business motive, trying to make sure that everything is done as effectively and efficiently as possible, so that customers are satisfied and generate revenues, but costs are reduced and saved on operational expenses and resources. So I think there's, those motivations are shared by startups in the West and the developing world. How would you um, compare the founders of startups in the developing world against the developed world in terms of their background, their education, um, and so on? Again, I think there are many similarities. Um, and I think really in many ways when we talk about startups and their founders, we're dealing with a global phenomenon, uh, almost a, a, a similar group of people, a tribe that's global. Um, and they're inspired by similar things and similar people and similar companies. Um, many of these companies that have inspired them are digital companies, which are in many ways global and were born global. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, we can think of the behemoths like Google and Amazon, and Facebook and Twitter and all those that are obviously inspirational and are available to most people in uh, the West, of course, but to large numbers in the developing world. So startup entrepreneurs and founders in the developing world are exposed to the same sorts of inspiration and role models as their counterparts in the West. But increasingly, even newer startups, you know, like the WhatsApps of the world, are inspirational to teenagers, um, young people in whether they're in India or Brazil, China or the US or the UK. So I think in many ways, this is a global tribe. They share many attributes. They're often young, but not always. Um, they are often well educated, but not too educated. Uh, they're not over educated. Um, they have some technical background, but not all of this. Um, sometimes they may come at this from a business angle, some of them sometimes they come from a technical angle. Very often they form teams and are good at working in teams, small teams, uh, where they realize uh, they can uh, have complementary skills and synergies. Uh, uh, they are cosmopolitan. They are 
optimistic, positive. They want, uh, they're, more, they're idealistic, want to make a difference, but they're pragmatic. So those are some of the things that I think these uh, the entrepreneurs that uh, I've written about, whether they're from the West or the East, seem to have in common. Um, which markets, uh, in terms of disruption, do you think are the most exciting at the moment? And is there a difference? Is, is there a difference between the developed and the undeveloped world or developing world? Well, if you start with the developing world, then most of the big um, innovations really are happening in core sectors, uh, which meet core needs that have been hitherto unmet for large numbers of people. So these are financial services where large numbers of people are still unbanked in the developing world. Uh, energy, where often people are uh, don't have access to the electricity grid and tend to use very poor quality uh, biomass or kerosene. And now we see interesting off-grid or mini-grid solutions in solar or in clean, other forms of clean tech. Um, so we see this in uh, health and healthcare, medical devices, but also new forms of telemedicine and uh, community care, primary care in remote areas. Um, we see this in education, where very large numbers of people increasingly want their children to be educated, even if they want. Um, and so we see very interesting applications of IT, again, to do things like distance learning. Uh, telecoms is the obvious one, huge, huge innovations in telecoms, in the handsets, to make them ever cheaper and ever smarter, uh, but also in the service uh, services and 3G, 4G, streaming, all those kinds of things. So really it's the core sectors, uh, and it, as you see, it's across the board, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, affordable two-wheelers, uh, electric scooters, uh, $2,000 automobiles, you know, so you see, uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a revolution happening across the board in the developing world. I think to a great extent that's reflected in the developed world, particularly where data can be brought to bear on the solution, to offer an end-to-end -end solution that's much more responsive to the customer's needs, that's closer to the customer, where data, very detailed time series, data can be collected and used by the company to provide an even better solution, to the, a customized solution to the customer. So obviously we've seen that in things like uh, the outstanding examples are Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. They have uh, basically been built around intelligent use of data to, to develop a very close uh, long-term relationship with customers to offer a personalized end-to-end -end service. But we're seeing that philosophy increasingly extend to all kinds of sectors, you know, from financial services, where you see fintech companies essentially helping people to manage their finance, finances better based on an intelligent use of their own data, on their own behavior, much like Amazon does with books. Uh, but we see that in edutech, where now, particularly with online education, it's possible to track the behavior of many people individually and in relation to others to offer them a better learning experience and to benchmark and give them feedback from online communities. So you see that a lot in sectors where data can be brought to bear. And of course, for many years in the past, that was very much about software. But increasingly, thanks to a revolution in hardware, particularly open source hardware, thanks to things like the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, thanks to things like 3D printing and sensors and low frequency radio uh, developments uh, and smartphones, we're starting to see an internet of things revolution uh, going, getting off the ground where all kinds of smart applications, whether they are in uh, smarter use of energy, smarter use of financial data, smarter use of learning data, uh, smarter use of agricultural data to help farmers uh, make better use of water and uh, fertilizer. Uh, so I think we're starting to see again uh, in the West an across-the-board kind of disruption happening. What does Cambridge University do to uh, try to encourage uh, the next Google equivalent, uh, the next Facebook equivalent, uh, to come out of the UK, to come out of Europe? Yeah, 
so Cambridge has, over the years, particularly the last 50 years or so, developed um, a very, uh, somewhat organically actually, developed an ecosystem that supports the uh, initiation and growth of startups, particularly in sectors like life sciences, um, computing, software, uh, things like that. Um, and the university has been part of it. The university, I suppose, by virtue of existing uh, in a small but uh, hospitable town, which attracts talent from all over the world. Um, and so by virtue of existing, by virtue of doing high quality academic research, particularly in the sciences and engineering, uh, and by giving its academics freedom to pursue that, that research either for academic purposes or for commercial purposes. The university has stimulated, I think, that the growth of that ecosystem. But other things have also happened, like banks, like Barclays came early on and set up a bank to, uh, to lend to startups. We had um, uh, big uh, uh, investments from like the Wellcome Trust set up a very big research center in biomedical science. Um, and genetics. Uh, we had uh, Trinity College and then St. John's College setting up science parks to house these startup companies and incubate them. We had uh, our business school itself, where I worked at business school, um, set up to, to, to train people to be able to do business, both within our formal programs but also through our outreach. So, for instance, we have an accelerator which, which helps startups to to improve their value proposition, get mentoring, get uh, early stage uh, investment. The university set up a company, a technology transfer organization called Cambridge Enterprise to help academics uh, improve their ideas, their technical ideas, and move them towards commercialization, patenting them, offering them up for licensing to companies, uh, helping with the legal aspects of that, and so forth. So very many things have happened, some initiated by the university, some happened serendipitously, but now we have a very rich ecosystem where all the different parts of, uh, of an innovation startup hub exist, uh, cheek by jowl in a very small but prospective town and so extent. Okay. Um, is there more that the government could do to help you with your objectives as far as uh, startups are concerned and supporting them? Well, I, I often ask that question and my initial response is, well, first they should do no harm. Uh, having uh, now many such assets uh, in their uh, economy, uh, like Cambridge, not just Cambridge, the UK is very fortunate to have uh, perhaps more than uh, most countries per capita, a very innovative universities and um, a whole cluster of these around the southeast in particular, so the London, Oxford, Cambridge Triangle. There are several world-beating research universities which also happen to have this ecosystem I was talking about that enables transferring many of those ideas from the university into a marketplace through startups. So in London alone you have Imperial, UCL, King's, um, you know, the list goes on, um, and then you have Oxford and Cambridge, and together they form a very powerful ecosystem. So I think having created those world-beating universities and that ecosystem, the, the government should be careful not to do anything that might harm them and undo that good work. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I mean, simply the question of... Um, uh, of attracting good students from other, around the world is crucial to maintaining the liveliness of that ecosystem. And if the, uh, if, if the, if the government is, uh, imposes harsh visa requirements and restrictions, bright young students would otherwise come to the UK from India, China, African economies, mm -hmm. North America, Latin America, who would otherwise have come to the UK would go elsewhere. They would go to Australia, they'd go to Canada, they'd go to France, Germany, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's important for that the government does not harm the access that these universities have to bright, good talent. You know, if you take Silicon Valley, for instance, one of the reasons Silicon Valley exists is because 
American universities in that area have been open to students from all over the world. And um, upwards of 50% of Silicon Valley startups uh, have been set up by immigrants, particularly from China and India. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and the same thing is possibly true for Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so I think that's, that's something that governments should keep in mind that they have these assets and they shouldn't tamper with them, if they have the assets. Um, now, what else can they do? Well, I think they can um, they can do things like, uh, I don't know if you know about Tech City. Do you know about yeah. Tech City? So Tech City was a government initiative. In fact, it was in the cabinet office, I think. Um, and its objective was to stimulate entrepreneurship in London. And they were very successful with that in a short period of time. The whole Silicon Roundabout phenomenon happened. And then they spun it off as a company called Tech City UK to stimulate entrepreneurship in other parts of the world, in other urban clusters. And so that's, that was very, I think, effective. Those kinds of things can be very helpful. They can champion and stimulate entrepreneurial activity. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about Tech City UK is that they realized that there are lots of startups in the UK. The UK is very good at creating uh, companies, uh, the UK government policies are very enlightened and liberal in this regard. It's, it's relatively easy to set up a company in Britain, far easier than most countries in the world, and that's another thing the government can do. Uh, but uh, Tech City realized that a lot of the people who set up businesses in the UK, they have technical skills but often don't have business skills. They don't have uh, the basics of finance, accounting, marketing, branding. Those kinds of things which are just as important, if not more important, the technical skills of the success of a business. And so they set up something called the Digital Business Academy, which was an online academy. Um, and they recruited people from various uh, British uh, business schools, including our own, uh, to, to develop uh, online courses that entrepreneurs could take for free in areas like marketing and finance. And I developed a couple of those courses myself. And I think those kinds of initiatives can be very helpful. So the government can do that. The government can create the infrastructure, obviously, to, to help with this. And if we're talking about digital, then the obvious infrastructure is high-speed broadband. Mm -hmm. um, the government can create standards to help with the creation of new technologies and the spread and adoption of new technologies. The government can create enlightened light touch regulation to ensure that um, new initiatives are stimulated rather than dampened. Um, they, they need to, of course, protect citizens and customers uh, and to some extent existing businesses, but they have to be very careful not to overprotect them at the expense mm -hmm. of new, new startups. So regulation is another area. And then simply championing things like, for instance, the maker movement. One of the things I talk about in my new book, Frugal Innovation, which came out this year, um, and it's about frugal innovation in the West, is the so-called maker movement, where these uh, proactive consumers, prosumers, are increasingly tinkering and making things, not just software, but things, like Internet of Things, um, you know, devices, and so forth. And they're doing this in spaces, like mm -hmm. make spaces or fab labs or tech shops. Uh, and they have maker fairs where they exhibit their, mm -hmm. you know, uh, their devices and, and, and their, uh, what they made. Um, uh, it's very interesting that Barack Obama uh, last year hosted a uh, maker fair in the White House to stimulate this kind of thing in Champion. These are the kinds of things that governments can do. Um, who are the top five startups to watch, in your opinion? Uh, this is probably a subjective account, uh, but... Uh, oh, I, I should say, with, what uh, are the top... Pi. Uh, Raspberry Pi is my favorite okay. frugal innovation, right out of Cambridge, started by my former student, Evan Upton. Um, I, I love it for many reasons. I love it for its vision um, and how they came about, uh, got the idea, uh, which was um, their concern that fewer young people were applying to study computer science in Cambridge and elsewhere. And the ones who did apply didn't seem to have much experience with the hardware of computers. They never opened a computer, they hadn't done much coding. And they said, what if we can produce a computer that's so basic and so cheap, you could give one to every school kid in the UK and they could tinker and if it broke, it would be a big deal. And 
we developed this tiny little thing for about $35, about 25 pounds a few years ago um, uh, and launched it on the market. They thought they'd sell a few thousand units. They've sold over a million units now. Um, and not only to kids to help them code, but often to their parents, particularly their dads, many of whom are makers and are using the Raspberry Pi to make other Google devices. Another Raspberry Pi just came out two weeks ago with a four pound, five dollar uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. So that's just amazing. Their vision, their scale, uh, their global outlook, because they're interested in helping in education in other parts of the world where mm -hmm. kids don't have access to the internet, don't have access to the YouTube and all the wonderful materials available there. And so the Raspberry Pi becomes a way to, to do that, to mm -hmm. help those kids uh, store some, store these uh, educational tools and then use things like uh, television screens, which they mm -hmm. often have access to as monitors. So I'd say Raspberry Pi is a favorite start for mine. Uh, another startup, again a biased uh, subjective one, is another Cambridge startup called uh, Synprints. Uh, just uh, recently launched um, by a group of Cambridge students who are all Gates scholars. So Bill Gates mm -hmm. gave some money to the university some years ago to specifically for the purpose of um, uh, scholarships for um, graduate students. Yeah. Well, not only academically gifted, but uh, keen to yeah. Yes, carry, carry on, please. Keen to make a difference in uh, in wherever they came from, other parts of the world, and so these four Gates scholars, one of whom was my student Toby Norman, uh, a few years ago, I think that first year of their respective PhD programs, entered a competition uh, locally in Cambridge. Uh, where the challenge was related to something public health. And so, you know, they just had to pitch an idea and show a basic prototype. And they chose this idea of um, public health programs in developing countries where doctors typically go from the city to the countryside to do things like vaccination campaigns. And frequently uh, would be sitting in front of someone from the village and they don't know that person's identity and they don't have their records, their medical records. They don't know really what they should be doing. Um, so they said, well, what can we do? Uh, maybe we can use the fingerprint of the patient as a way to identify the patient and then pull up the records. And we know that the doctors will have at least text-enabled mobile phones. So can we convert the visual information of the fingerprint into text and text that information to a central server, which could be in the district hospital, that will pull up the ID with the records and text them back to the doctor so that real time the doctor can decide Okay, this lady has a five-year-old daughter who needs an extra round of vaccinations, etc. So with that vision, and they want some money for from this competition, they essentially bootstrap uh, this business. Uh, they um, use the make space in Cambridge uh, to meet others. For instance, uh, ACE software programmers from Cambridge's largest company, Arm, that were absolutely amazed at the a vision of these students at their hootspot because they didn't really have uh, much technical background but were attacking this problem. And really they bootstrapped and got volunteers and so on to develop many different versions of a prototype. Um, they've uh, now got uh, significant funding from ARM, the Gates Foundation and DFID and will be doing a very big field trial in Bangladesh um, along with people from Johns Hopkins University uh, early next year. Um, there are about 10 members strong and plan to grow to about 20 very soon. So that's another startup that uh, I'm keen on. Uh, let's see, what are some of the others? What's your definition of a startup? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> throwing a question back at me. Um, yeah, you know, there are startups and startups. There are some that are pretty young, but have grown massive in a very short period of time. I, I think that there are differing uh, opinions about that. I think that um, um, some companies which are um, which were launched even a couple of years ago are still termed as a startup. Yeah. Um, some people think that it's to do with the number of staff. Yeah. Uh, some people. Uh, have said that it's about about where you are in the scaling up process. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw that question back at you. 
What do you, okay, how so how do you do? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let me run this by you. I'm very I, I'm a huge fan of blah blah car. So what's blah blah car? It's the it's a French um, startup. Oh, it's the sharing car service. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So French startup, um, you know, it's, uh, and it's been around for a few years, but its growth has really happened in the last uh, five years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially, it allows uh, people who are commuting from one city to another, say mm-hmm. Brussels to Antwerp, yeah. to uh, sell the spare seats in that car to other people on the platform to yes. cover their costs. Yes. To cover the cost of the journey. So mm-hmm. I, I, I love this idea. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it uh, serves so many unmet needs for people. And the idea, it's not the idea, because he was trying to get from one French town to another, I forget which, during uh, Christmas time to be with his family. And uh, it was too late for him. He couldn't get a train ticket. He couldn't get a bus ticket. And uh, he was somewhere on a highway, and he saw all these cars, you know, streaming past with one person in them. Mm-hmm. And he's thinking, I can, you know, if I could get a ride with one of them, if I wouldn't even need to bother with the train. Um, and that's where he got the idea. And uh, I had to uh, overcome several obstacles, including legal obstacles. Mm-hmm. And this is where regulation, I think, is very important. Uh, governments have to think about how they will, uh, in, you know, uh, empower the likes of blah, blah, car in the face of opposition from taxi drivers and the like. Mm-hmm. Cleverly, he doesn't take on ca- taxi drivers, unlike Uber, because it's not, it's intercity, not intercity. And so taxis do not generally fly. He's actually competing with trains. Mm-hmm. And speaking of trains, they, uh, in about four or five years, now transport more people in Western Europe than Eurostar does. So I'm a huge fan of Lavata. Another issue is, okay, if you're taking money from people mm-hmm. and you're not a business, how does it work in terms of taxes? So there's a legal issue there. Mm-hmm. And very cleverly, again, the business is not a business as such in that you can cover, you're taking money from people to cover the cost of your journey. And so there are, there are no tax implications. So there are these clever things that uh, he's built into his model to avoid some of the regulatory and other issues mm-hmm. that Uber, for instance, is facing or that Airbnb is facing. Um, so I'd say of the sharing economy ones, I'm particularly keen on blah, blah, car, even though Uber and Airbnb get all the kudos. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's three. I have two more to go. Okay, let me see. Um, another one that I'm very keen on is uh, a baby warmer uh, called Embrace. Uh, and this is, uh, this was a, uh, uh, a product that came from four students again. I'm very keen on student teams, as you can see. Mm-hmm. Four students who took a course at Stanford a few years ago, and the course was called Design for Extreme Affordability. And the objective of the course was to develop, um, uh, you could develop a working prototype that was 100th the cost of the existing solution, whatever the solution was. Oh, fascinating, so they, yeah. So, so they chose incubators, you know, uh, and, you know, a typical incubator from a company like GE might be something like $20,000. Mm-hmm. It'll be a beautiful machine. It'll have all the bells and whistles, and no infant that has access to it will probably come to harm. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, $20,000 is just way beyond the reach of most people in the world, particularly mm-hmm. in the developing world, particularly mm-hmm. in rural areas. So they said, okay, can we come up with something uh, for two hundred dollars or less, and their idea was a baby warmer. So it's not an incubator. For instance, it doesn't have an oxygen tent, but it was designed to deal with a large part of the problem that incubators are designed to deal with, which is infant mortality. When infants are born one or two weeks prematurely, they can't maintain their body temperature, so in many cases they will die. And this baby warmer would ensure that they would it would help them maintain their body temperature. And so they had this idea, and then they went to a tech shop in uh, Palo Alto, and they, their initial idea was, can it be like a blanket that the mother can swaddle the baby in and hold the baby? So that gave the baby some warmth, but you need to have temperature constant, so that's a, you need something technical there. And they happened to meet someone at the tech shop who was a NASA scientist, <laughs> and uh, he, he said, 
you know, NASA sends people up into space. The space suits have got those properties. And he said, have you heard of phase change materials? And uh, they said no, and, and he told them what they were. And so they, the, the blanket has a pad that's made of this waxy phase change material, and that can be heated either using electricity or, or hot water, and then that will keep the temperature fixed for a period of time. So anyway, they had that idea, and then when they graduated, they went on to raise venture capital funding, they did clinical trials in the Stanford Medical Hospital. They went to Nepal to test it with mothers and midwives. Then they ended up in South India testing it with rural mothers and midwives. And several years later now, they have, for instance, a non-exclusive licensing agreement with GE Healthcare in India. It's been rolled out in several Indian states and in other countries outside India. So that's uh, number four. It's going to be tricky now for me to do <laughs> don't, this. Don't worry. That, I mean, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, can do this? In, fa mean, in fact... <laughs> also, I mean, one, because I just love all these ideas. So this thing I'm holding up, I don't know if you can see it. Um, this is uh, a solar lighting solution. So this little kit... And what is it called? Planet. It's called Sun King. Mm -hmm. um, by a company called Green Light Planet. Uh-huh. And it sells for 800 rupees, so that's about uh, 10 pounds, less than 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So even poor people in remote villages in India and Africa can typically afford this. And they can afford it up front. They can you know, save a bit and actually pay in cash. And this, they'll break even about a month and a half if they're substituting it for kerosene, which is what they typically use for lighting. And it'll last them for a year and a half. So they're just... You know, it's just hugely important or helpful for them. It's a way better quality light than kerosene. It doesn't cause fires. It doesn't let off noxious mm -hmm. fumes. And it's economical for them. Again, students. Yes, yeah. Students uh, took, uh, in engineering students this time from the University of uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, mm -hmm. did this as their summer project. And they started to work technically and then they went on to set up a company and they sold several millions of these in India and in Africa. And at one point, you could buy them on Amazon, and you could buy one, give one free. Um, so, those are my five. If Cambridge University gave you $200 million to invest in uh, solving a world problem with a, a social business idea, um, which area in which, I mean, which, which area would you choose to invest the money in? And what problem would you try to solve with the money you, uh, and it has to be one area no you can if, you, okay. if you'd like to choose a number of areas go yeah. ahead so I think uh, I'd probably choose three or four okay. so one of them would definitely be energy cleaner better energy solutions and I would tend to favor solar so this could be mini grid solutions, micro grid solutions for communities to do lighting principally, possibly heating, uh, heating water, things like that, um, possibly cooking. Uh, so, so energy would be one and it would be solar. Uh, another would be financial inclusion. And it would be some kind of mobile based financial payments solution whereby consumers can uh, receive and send payments uh, electronically through their phones um, and save money um, and um, buy insurance. Uh, so financial inclusion would be another one, mobile-based ideally. A third one would be education. Mm -hmm. um, there's a huge problem around the world, in the developing world in particular, uh, and, uh, of, of education, uh, and I'm talking about primary, primary and secondary education, and the problem is as follows. You often have state infrastructure. You have buildings, school buildings, uh, even in rural areas, uh, set up by the state. The state uh, countries, even in Africa, various in Asian countries, Latin American countries, they do have trained teachers in the state system, and the teachers are paid. They're paid quite well. Uh, children go to school increasingly, um, often because it's a midday meal, free midday meal, and parents want their children to be educated. There are laws against child labor, which are often implemented quite well. 
The problem is the pair, the teachers don't show up in the state schools. So the big problem of teacher absenteeism uh, for various, often administrative reasons, bureaucratic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so in a situation like that, I think there is a huge opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer learning enabled by cheap computers. And these computers don't necessarily have to be linked to the internet. I give the example of the Raspberry Pi. There are people who are taking the Raspberry Pi and loading it with the Khan Academy, which is the entire U.S. school curriculum available for free on YouTube. Loading it with that uh, and, and, and thus enabling kids who don't have access to the internet, who may not even have access to PCs with a PC monitor, but often have access to television, so they can use a television as a monitor. And we know from experiments that often even kids in urban slums, in places like India, are able to teach each other without any help how to use computers. They've done these hole in the wall, wall uh, experiments where they literally, in a hole in the wall, put a computer with a mouse and a keyboard. And in three days, slum kids have figured out how to use Word, PowerPoint, surf the internet, and stuff like that. So I think in education, there's a huge opportunity to use uh, simple, robust tablets or um, you know, uh, Raspberry Pi type devices to teach kids basic stuff, but also to help them to tinker. Uh, I was amazed to discover there's a community in Togo. Uh, these are slightly older people, but mm -hmm. they, have, they have basic education, who have uh, who are using eBay e-waste. They're recycling e-waste by making 3D printers. And of course, then they use the 3D printers to do other stuff. So there's immense potential there for people to use even their native intelligence to educate themselves and to, to do creative stuff, which is productive. And so education would be another one. If you give me another another go, I'd say health. Health is another obvious one. Um, from nutrition, better nutrition, to prevent, preventative health. Basically, preventing things like diabetes uh, by just improving diets uh, and nutrition. This is around the world, and you know telemedicine as well. Again, typically mobile and um, So those would be my top. Topics. Okay, have you been? Have you ever been um, tempted to launch your own startup? I mean, one could argue that the books that you've written have been startups in themselves frugal innovation uh and this next one um how the west can be how how, how the west can learn to do more with less uh in a, in a sense they're startups but 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 uh, any plans to um launch anything similar to the people that you or not similar but uh, additional startup if that isn't a contradiction in terms yeah <laughs> No, great idea, and I have thought about it, but I'm well aware of what it takes to be successful in this space, and I'm well aware of my limitations in that regard. Um, I think that doing these kinds of things, while very inspiring and, um, uh, and exciting, is very difficult. Um, it takes a lot of commitment and patience and dedication over a long period of time. And I think in many ways, um, I don't have that bandwidth simply because of my, my current, uh, my career, basically, my, my, my vocation as, a, mm -hmm. as an academic. Uh, and so I don't think I have, I don't have the risk taking as well. I don't have that. That's probably why I'm an academic and not in business. Um, but I feel that as an academic, I can uh, help these entrepreneurs by giving them my advice because I'm able to look across uh, solutions and, sit and have a sense of what works. But more importantly, writing about them and celebrating them and helping them to uh, learn about each other. So in many ways, I feel that writing these books is actually a better way for me to use my sort of talents and my proclivities mm -hmm. in this space and leave the real work to people who can do the real work. Who do you think are the most um, impressive uh, founders of startups? Even even the ones that you wouldn't turn startups now. For example, Richard Branson of Virgin. 
in your opinion, people you've met during the course of your career, who, who were the most impressive? So, um, there are probably several. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, it's more than one person because there are, they, were, they were known as the Magnificent Seven. This is the founding team of India's, one of India's largest software companies, Infosys. Mm-hmm. Um, this was founded in the early 80s by these Magnificent Seven who had no family background in business, had no links with the government. Uh, they simply had their own education uh, in technology, not computing, and uh, set up this software company in India, which wasn't known for anything really in business in the early 80s. It was a completely closed economy uh, and completely dominated by a few large families and the government. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't even have their own computers. They had to hire them and hire computing time, but began to very ambitiously serve Western customers mm-hmm. out of India, mm-hmm. which wasn't, you know, this is pre-internet, pre-globalization, imagine how hard it was and pre-liberalization in India, mm-hmm. India was still very close and uh, they struggled with this for many years but they found a business model to do outsourcing or back office stuff for Western companies and they stuck with it and then by 98 it became one billion dollar and now it has several billion dollars and it's probably the poster child of India's sort of software revolution and outsourcing business uh, and so I'm a huge admirer of the seven people who set it up Particularly, uh, I mean, one of them, who uh, is a guy called Nandan Nilekani. And Nandan Nilekani uh, was, uh, he ended up being the CEO of the company. And he's a guy who gave Thomas Friedman that phrase, the world is flat. I don't know if you remember that book by Tom Friedman called The World is Flat. Mm -hmm. So Tom Friedman had gone around looking at what was happening in places like India and IT and so on. And uh, he met Mandan and he went to Infosys and they happened to go into this big uh, convocation hall, this big conference hall that Infosys has. And on the screen, the big screen, they had all the different, there was a big conference going on and then people joined from different parts of the world. And Nandan pointed to it and said, look, Tom, the world is flat. And you know, also meaning that everybody's on the same you can be in Bangalore and talk to people in other parts of the world. Yes. And so he got this. So anyway, that's London. And then he quit Infosys and he went to do something really unusual. He went to work in the Indian government and he set up a startup in the Indian government around giving every Indian a unique ID based on their 10 fingerprints, the iris scan, and uh, their name and date of birth and their address. Just that. Mm-hmm. to give them a unique identification uh, which would help particularly those uh, who are uh, in poverty to access all the government services that are their due but which they often cannot access because they don't have a way of proving their identity. And so he felt that this would not only empower you know, upwards of 200 million Indians, particularly those at the bottom, but would also make government programs more efficient because one of the big problems with government programs is uh, corruption. And it's been estimated that for every 100 rupees the government spends, only 15 or 20 actually get through to the intended beneficiary. And this could be in public in, in, in uh, public distribution of food, in subsidies for fuel, and, you know, goes on. Uh, so he started that, and this, you know, it's a really daunting task because technically it was difficult. Operationally, it's massive. India has 1.2 billion people. Uh, they don't keep good records. The hospitals are not great, so you don't record births that easily. Um, and uh, other government departments were hostile towards him. And then he had come from outside government, so people within government were hostile to him. And nevertheless, uh, in the space of now maybe four or five years, um, something like 900 million people in India have been registered on this. So 900 million people have a unique idea. And it was done very proven, very cheaply. Uh, they essentially had a budget of um, uh, $2 per person. So My goodness. To give an idea. 
And so anyway, uh, he's uh, certainly someone I admire hugely um, for what he's done. Um, you wanted me to say some more names? It, uh, if, you, if, if any spring to mind, that would be great. Yeah. Well, another, another person, I suppose, I don't know him very well, but he hears a lot about him. Uh, and I'm sure there are pros and cons. But this Elon Musk, uh, so, I um, mean, he made his fortune in PayPal, I think, so financial services. And then, you know, the sheer vision and ambition of the guy, he goes into automobiles and electric cars based out of Silicon Valley. And he takes on an industry that's 100 years old. Um, with Tesla, so you know the sheer vision and uh, boots power of that, I, I find that impressive. And then he has SpaceX to send, you know, uh, to develop a, uh, a rocket that can be reused. Um, and he's thinking about you know habit, uh, Mars habitat. So again, the sheer you know audacity of his vision and his monomania in the sense of achieving his big goals and also his approach which I've heard is very interesting one and very frugal because what he does is he goes back to the drawing board you know he doesn't try to build up what's uh, what others have done in the sense that okay we have cars so can we tweak a car to make it an electric car went back to the drawing board and then thinks about if we were to start from scratch today how should we build a car so that it's efficient you know and cheap, affordable, all that kind of stuff. Same thing with the rockets and other things he's doing. And then his vision to set up, uh, you know, making make a big factory to make batteries because solar will depend crucially on our ability to store the energy. And batteries will be the bottleneck unless we can make breakthroughs in the batteries. So Elon Musk would be another impressive guy. Um, I mentioned uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, I don't know a whole lot about Evan Upton. He was my student, but I haven't really studied him carefully. Uh, I'm trying to think who else might be. I don't know the. So another person I uh, I I don't know very well, but I'm, in the sense that I haven't read much about him, but is uh, is Jack Dorsey of Twitter. So having done what he did with Twitter, he then went on to do something called Square. You know Square. Mm -hmm. And I think that's impressive too. And he got the idea again. And I'm fascinated more by how these people get ideas, you know, and how good they are at finding ideas. So uh, somebody, a friend of his, was saying how he was trying to sell uh, some uh, hardware, household hardware, out of his garage, and he couldn't because he couldn't take credit card payments. And so he thought, well, lots of people must have that problem. And then he came up with a square, actually in a tech shop again, he developed a prototype which fits it into your smartphone and can make credit card payments. So that, another guy I, I, uh, I'm, I hugely admire, although he's probably his company is no longer a startup, is Jeff Bezos. So again, this is a guy who relentlessly focuses on innovation. I mean, he could have sat back on Saturn and Laurel for a long time ago, but the guy's unstoppable. So with Amazon, Amazon has gone on to do so many different things. Mm. I mean, this is constantly innovating. It, you know, first it just sells books, then it sells other things, then it acts as a platform for anyone to sell anyone a book or any other thing. Um, then it does cloud computing, it does drones, it does e-readers, it's not thinking of groceries, you can pick up your Amazon from lock. I mean, this is relentless, what they're trying to do. I mean, you know, it's unstoppable. And Amazon, by the way, have uh, beaten SpaceX to coming up with a reusable rocket. So they just did an experiment and they succeeded with a reusable Amazon did it. So, you know, I mean, he's, he's certainly an impressive guy. Um, and then I suppose, uh, I think the Google founders, those two guys are pretty impressive too. Uh, Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page. So, yeah. Okay. Um, you, yeah. You've spent a lot of time around people like this and studying um, innovation, disruption, startups. Um, when, a, when a new batch of students um, starts at Cambridge, do you ever look across the room or within the first few weeks have a feeling for whether they're likely to be the founder of a startup? 
I mean, you mentioned earlier that um, what you find so fascinating about these people is the abil their ability to come up with ideas, I, and these ideas being um, solutions to market problems <laughs> that possibly we hadn't even worked out was a problem at all in the first place. Um, you, do you have this, a sense of it? Can you spot these people? And is there an example that you could share? So I can't claim to be able to spot these people unless they sort of send me, give me a signal that they are interested. Uh, I mean, I have to have a conversation with them before I can realize. But... Of course you have to have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But um, as they sit in the uh, class or, or the yeah. sort of lecture hall, um, and they're possibly asking you questions, interacting with you. Yeah. Uh, do you get a sense of a special sparkle, a special yeah. something about them, a special energy? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I do. And, uh, I, you know, it's various things. I mean, it can be as simple as they actually stay back after the class to have a conversation with you about something. And mm. it's not an abstract conversation about what would be on the test. Yes. <laughs> it's a question about, oh, you know that example you gave? So can you tell me more about that person or that business? And, you know, they keep probing and then very quickly you realize that they want to do something similar. Or they actually had that idea themselves. Mm. So just yesterday, for instance, I was teaching a session to our... Um, so as a business school, we, we teach a business uh, to people in other parts of the university, mm -hmm. including our... Uh, doctoral students in science and technology. So all doctoral students in science and technology are funded, and this is another way in which the government can help, are funded, many of them are funded by you know, the research councils, particularly the engineering and physical research council. And there are so-called doctoral training centers that have been set up in various universities, including ours. And so all the members of the doctoral training center go through a four-day course on entrepreneurship and innovation and business. So they were, they had their penultimate day yesterday, and I I went to tell them talk about frugal innovation on the possibilities. And you know, some of them were listening, some were clearly not listening. I don't know what they were doing. They were playing on their on their PCs. Uh, they might have been doing programming or looking at their their lab uh, lab data or something. Some were listening. Uh, and ask questions, but the questions were, you know, questions that any intelligent person might ask. But two people were sitting in the corner, and they looked a little more mature than the others. There were some were real kids, and, you know, possibly very focused on their academics. Anyway, these two guys were listening, and I, I, I just got the sense looking at them that they were listening in a different way. And I showed, at some point, I showed an example of a product which is an Internet of Things product that farmers can use to sense the soil, sense nutrients in the soil and moisture levels in the soil, and then sends that data to a smartphone that collects it. And the moment I put it up, they said something. <laughs> and I looked at them and I said, what? And they had the same idea. They had the same idea. Even before taking this course, or before hearing about me at all. And I could see there was that initial disappointment that uh, <laughs> that somebody has when they think, oh, somebody else is onto this. And then I immediately reassured them that that didn't mean they couldn't do better. And then, of course, they immediately, and then afterwards, they wanted to talk about it. So I think there's that, you, you detect that in people, this kind of passion, the way of thinking, that they're practical, they want to solve, solve problems, they've often had thought about these things themselves. And then that sheer persistence perseverance that you only see after a period of time. Um, so for instance, this, uh, my student Toby Norman was behind Simprix, the, the, the thing that would get your ID from your fingerprint. I mean, he was my PhD student and, and um, you know, we had conversations and I could tell that uh, he was really committed to solving uh, these big problems in public health and really that was what was driving him to uh, make something of this. He didn't enter that competition on a lark like many people might. Uh, and when they won it, he didn't stop them. He persisted and uh, you know took other people along and 
will continue to persist till it actually makes a difference in the field. Mm -hmm. So you see that kind of commitment which is needed to mm -hmm. solving the problem. And um, I think that's what I would look for in these kinds of people. So you, you detect the startup fever? Yeah, it's a startup fever, but it's not an idle thing. In the sense that they're not just in it for, you know, the fame or the money. There's a, it has real depth. Yeah, yes. there's something deeper. There's like an itch that will never go away. You know, so what you see in a lot of people in Cambridge, for instance, there's this phenomenon of serial entrepreneurs. There are people who've been around for 40 years in this ecosystem, who are involved with the very early experiments that Cambridge companies made in computing, you know, and came up with uh, with the BBC computer in the 70s and 80s. And those people then, some of them went on to form ARM that makes the chips. This is Cambridge's largest company now. Uh, so you see these people who've been involved with many different businesses and keep coming back. They don't need to. They've made more than enough money. They were enough. They could retire somewhere. But it's that itch to be able to do it again and to do it better, to do it in another area. Um, to solve another problem using the same uh, uh, approaches or to learn new approaches. So it's that. It's not the. It's not someone who's craving instant fame and success. It's someone who's got an itch that can't be satisfied, basically. Okay. That's the kind of person. If you could speak directly to a 16-year-old who... Um, has an idea and um, would like to be the founder of a startup one day. What do you think the most ideal path in terms of education is concerned in order to achieve that objective? Yeah, good question. It's a tough one. Um, first of all, I think they need to get an education. There's a lot of hype about, and usually from a few entrepreneurs who were successful without education or dropped out and so on. And you have the examples of the Bill Gates and the Mark Zuckerbergs and so on. But they were in education when they dropped out. Mm -hmm. And they were in very good places. They were in Harvard, MIT, whatever. So mm -hmm. they were very bright people. So I, and I, so I, don't, I don't for a moment uh, recommend that people just drop out and do it. I think mm -hmm. you need to have an education. But what kind of education? That's 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 the good question. And I think that's a very tricky question to answer because I don't think that kind of education is currently available from um, formal institutions. I don't think universities are anywhere near offering the kind of education people need, not just to set up startups, but to, to be to to realize that potential in the twenty first century. I well, think the oh, way I we see. teach I think the way we teach is possibly suited to the 19th, maybe in the first half of the 20th century. <laughs> but we don't, we don't train people yet to be fully functioning, flourishing members of the 21st century. And why, why do I say this? So, you know, we still teach things where people have to learn facts and learn stuff that's in books. Now, you need to learn some of that. You need to learn, obviously you need to know some mathematics, you need to be able to read and write well, and you need to be able to comprehend stuff and so on. You need to know a little bit of how the world works. But a lot of that factual learning that we test people on in exams is available at the touch of a button. If you know what to look for, you can find it. You don't need to bother yourself too much of that stuff, unless you're going to be a researcher. But if you're going to work in the world, you need to know how to make things. You need to know how to make people work, not just make things work. You need to be able to initiate projects. You need to be able to figure out what's worth doing and then how to do it, uh, how to take other people along, how to work with people who are very different from you, how to motivate them, um, um, how to solve difficult creative problems, life problems, uh, human problems. We don't train, teach people for any of that, except when we give them practical projects to work on. So in business school, we do quite a bit of that. They, they work in teams uh, for startups, they consult to startups, then they consult to big companies, and then they you know, do individual projects and internships. So it's that practical kind of experience that universities have traditionally not been very good at. 
But I think increasingly we are moving in that direction. You know, those twenty-first century skills: communication, leadership, creativity, um, empathy, uh, teamwork, cooperation, uh, initiative, all those kinds of things. So that sixteen-year-old, the sixteen-year-old could find such a program or such a place where they could get that. They could get it to being an apprentice, for instance, possibly, but there could be a right sort of apprentice. Uh, maybe work for a startup that's taking off. Um, that's why accelerators are very helpful, for, particularly for startups. And I always tell people who come who come to me with some sort of idea, find a start, an accelerator and sign up to a good accelerator program. Because essentially the accelerators are, are a curriculum for entrepreneurs. And they'll help you do in three months what would otherwise possibly take you two years if you were really smart. Um, and they put you in touch with the mentors and they put you through the rigors of testing your idea you know, from different angles, talking to customers, talking to suppliers, talking to competitors, and that kind of stuff. So I don't think we yet have a simple answer to your question, but uh, uh, failing uh, the tailored solution, going to any good university, and taking a course in computer science or in engineering or business design, um, you know, Steve Jobs, for instance, took a an elective in fonts or in calligraphy or something when he was in, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and many years later, that became crucial to Apple's success because yes. he was particular about and he knew fonts, and so you never know where you know. Stuff you learn can be useful. Professor J.D. Prabhu, thank you very much indeed for your time.